Thank you, brother. Well, it is a day, a day that I've looked forward to. I turned 59 years old last week, two weeks ago. <clears throat> I can't believe that. You're young, not old. That's right. 59 years young. Well, she, she has alluded to the fact that the reason I still play amateur baseball with the Atlanta Amateur Baseball League is to try to prove to myself what did Jerry Lee Lewis write that song, trying to prove he still can, <laughs> middle-aged crazy? No, it's because I love to throw the baseball. And as long as I can, I'll throw the baseball. So, um, but it's, it's when I was throwing it at 21, I have learned that at 59, I can still throw it. I throw just as hard as I ever did. I do. It just takes longer for the ball to get there than it used to. <laughs> that's all. That's the only difference. <laughs> So, uh, but when I, when I was 21 years old, it was a, uh, it was a banner year for me in, in my personal life. You know, aren't you glad that the Lord sees us throughout the spectrum of our entire life and he sees the fabric of our entire life and he knows what he's going to do with that entire fabric. And so he begins to prepare long in advance. It was, uh, I think it was, um, Abraham Lincoln that said, if I was given six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening the axe i think a lot of times that's the way god does with us if he's got you know a, a span of your life to deal with he'll sharpen you for two-thirds three-fourths of it to get the thing that he's that pearl of great price he wants done at the end of your life so don't don't try to live your whole life in six months expect him to have his hand in it all your life sweetheart what's your name yeah no 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 behind you see i've done that before I've done that before, remember? What's your name? Linda. He's blessing you. He's visiting you with a fresh visitation of the Holy Ghost. Expect some good things to come to you. I, I, mean, I can see it. I just saw him drop down on you. I'm announcing a guest speaker. I'm not ministering. So, in, in, uh, but see, I go to thinking back on those days, and, and the same spirit that visited me when I was a young man starts to visit me again. And uh, it was... Um, it was when I was 21, I had, I had gotten born again at, ni at 19, I was almost 20. Three days later, a man handed me 12 tapes and a Bible and said, you need, just need to get into the Word. You need to get into the Word. And I said, okay, I'll get into the Word. <laughs> I didn't know what the, I thought it was, you need to go dive off into the etheric. You need to, you need to go into the cloud of the entity. It's what it sounded like to me. I don't know what he meant by the word. And, uh, and I opened up the set of tapes and took my little tape player and started playing and the light came on in that little mobile home that my parents moved to after they downsized after my dad retired from Ford Motor Company. Was, I was the last one of six at home and, and uh, it's just, I mean, I went through that set of tapes. It was just so wonderful. It's called The Basic Believer's Bible Course by Kenneth Copeland. The second tape was called Real Bible Faith. And he talked about how a man that he knew got his son healed and how that they went and they read the word and confessed it and read it and confessed it and read it and confessed it and read it and confessed it and then they laid hands on him and the Spirit of God visited that room and they all started crying and he got his healing. A man by the name of Clark Stansel and his son. By Friday, I left the room. I stayed in there pretty much the whole week except to go to work. And I left the room and went in and laid my hands on mom by Friday. So I'm born again Sunday, get in some tapes on Tuesday, and lay hands on my mother on Friday. That's pretty quick spiritual growth, don't you think? Now, it was after that that I went to my aunt Bessie's funeral in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was there, and I met my uncle Drew, who I named my son Drew after. Uncle Drew was in a church of God at the time, and he and his, my aunt, my dad's sister, my aunt Hazel, were into Kenneth Copeland tapes. And I said, yeah, I said, I've been listening to him. I said, I've got his tapes. And she's, he said, well, he's on television now. And he told me what time to, to turn it on. It's on Channel 46, Atlanta, 1.30 in the afternoon. And I started watching Brother Copeland on television. And I'd rush in from, from church and set the ottoman up and set the tape player up, and when the... Uh, that old song uh, would come on that he would start. I'd plug it in, and me and Mom would sit there. Mom and I had the greatest fellowship around the word from 1978 to 1984. Well, um, he, he advertised one day on, on the television that uh, uh, he would be in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so a friend of mine and I took our week off, our vacation at our, at our warehouse where we, where we worked, 
and we drove to Charlotte. I still remember that the Days Inn charged us twenty nine ninety five a night for the room. And then he made a phone call, and because his mom worked for Days Inn, pulled us a deal for $21.95 a night. Can you believe that? And uh, I remember we got in the room, and we, and, uh, we were close enough to drive uh, to, to the, uh, the, the great convention center there, the Charlotte Convention Center. And I remember walking from where we parked his car down. He had a new 80, um, 80 Mustang. And we were walking down towards the, the back side of the convention center, and there was uh, the access doors and the roll-up doors, and there were tractor-trailer trucks, and there were other vendors. I didn't know what all they were. And there, there was uh, the several trucks there, and there was one truck on the side of it had, where will you spend eternity? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's Romans 6.23 on the side of it. And I saw uh, on the side, I was so excited to be there, I couldn't hardly wait. I didn't know what to expect, but I knew it was going to be wonderful. And on the side of one of the tractors, it said, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, Arlington, Texas. And I thought, saw how nice it was printed. And I looked, there was another truck, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, Fort Worth, Texas. And there was another tractor-trailer truck. And on the side of the tractor-trailer trucks were written in cursive handwriting where somebody had painted on there. One was called The Peacemaker. And the other truck was called Sweet Victory. And there was another truck. What was the name of the third one? The Believer. I remember that. And I, and I had a, I was, a, I was into CB radios back in those days. Everybody had a CB. That's how they, can you believe that? We used to have CB radios that we communicated. Hey, good buddy. What's your 10, what's your 1020? And uh, I remember my, my handle, my CB handle was mother's finest. <laughs> yes, it's still true. And I remember I, we, uh, we, I remember I thought this must be his CB handle. It must be the uh, sweet victory. There was a, I walked up, and there was a guy just standing out by the truck. He was doing something, pulling on something on the truck. And a truck driver, and of course, I had worked at a freight line, and so all truck drivers were just grizzled, rough, tobacco-chewing kind of guys. And that's what I was expecting to walk up on. And this guy walked, looked up at us, and, how are you boys doing today? We're fine. How are you? Just fine. He said, y'all coming to the convention? Uh, yes, sir. He said, where are y'all from? I said, Atlanta, Georgia. And... Uh, he, I said, we took our week off vacation to come here. He said, you took your vacation to come here. Well, you're going to be blessed. I said, we saw Brother Copeland. I got tapes for Brother Copeland uh, from a, a man that I know, and then I saw him on TV, and I started giving him my testimony. And then, and then we heard he was going to be in Charlotte, and we wanted to come to the meeting. And he turned, he looked at me, looked, and he, I remember him shut, kind of squinting his eyes. He said, and he put his hand right here. He said, son, Brother Copeland's the real thing. He said, you've done the right thing to come up here this week. I said, do you know Brother Copeland? He said, yes. He's a friend of mine. And I looked, I was marveling that he knew Brother Copeland. I said, you do? He said, yeah. He said, you're going to have a good week. I said, I appreciate that. Thank you. And he reached up with his hand and just patted me right here. And when he did, I almost busted out crying. I was so excited about the meeting. And I realized that here's a man that he said he drove for Brother Copeland. This was his truck. And I thought, and he was different than every truck driver I ever met. And, uh, and so we left, went on into the convention center. That meeting, that's the first time I saw Brother Norville. And then Charles Capps was preaching, different ones. And, and uh, so the next day I looked. I came back down the same way and didn't see him. The next day I came back down and didn't see him again. But I always looked for him. That was in 1980. Fast forward to 1997, I went to the first minister's conference in Fort Worth, and Bill and Lori Dennington said, we're going to go out with Dennis and Carmen and, and Rob and Trish, and y'all want to go? I said, yeah. Went to an IHOP, and we're sitting there, and I didn't know these folks, and I kept looking at this one guy. I kept looking at him. I said, have you ever been to Atlanta? Yeah, I've been through there. Yeah, we got folks there. Did you, you ever been to such such meeting? No. Do you know so-and-so? No. We couldn't make the connection. And then it was mentioned at the, at the dinner we were at that he drove for Brother Copeland, and it hit me. That's him, the one I met in 1980 that patted on me and told me I was going to have a, a good week. He's here. <laughs> he patted on me like that. Y'all welcome, Pastor Rob Sowell to the pulpit.
He's here. Hallelujah. Well, go. Let me get, get you. Get your cut on. Hallelujah. Get your cut on. There you go. I'm on. Now you have glory, on. glory, glory. Oh, God is good. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to let you have your word from up here. <laughs> oh, glory. How many thought I was taller than what I am? <laughs> I tell people, by the way, thank you, Pastor. Uh, I tell people when I, was, when I was 14, 15 years old, I was six foot tall. <clears throat> My dad worked me so hard, he wore me down to a five foot seven nub, so this is what you got. So <laughs> Uh, before I get into the word, what, I, look, I look back on that past. I remember that. After you started sharing that last night, I, I remember that. Uh, that God so divinely blessed me <laughs> to drive that truck for Brother Copeland. R real quick, I, I didn't know how to drive a semi. I'm, I'm serious. And when I was working with Brother Copeland, uh, the general manager asked me one day, he said, uh, can you drive a semi? And I said, yes. <laughs> I never said in one. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll capsule this. And uh, the truck, uh, Brother Copeland on one truck at that particular time. And Ed Hodgman was the driver of it. He said, Rob, you know how to drive a truck? I said, you teach me, I'll drive it. So we went out on the, we went out on the property and drove and he took me around. And I went through 13 gears, didn't miss a gear, backed it up. Went to downtown Fort Worth. We had to rent a truck to drive to, to uh, California. My first trip was from Fort Worth to California. Wow. And uh, I went to that uh, Ryder Truck Lines, and it was a different truck. <laughs> it, was, it was a cab over International with a nine-speed. I wasn't familiar with that, with that shift pattern, but I wasn't familiar with the 13-speed shift pattern either, <laughs> but didn't miss a gear with that thing. So anyway, I, I checked everything on the truck and the guy backed it out. He said, now you get under the wheel and back it up underneath that trailer over there. So I backed it up underneath the trailer. Run up the, run up the landing gear. Hooked, hooked the hoses up where they ought to be. He said, let's go to downtown Fort Worth. Because oh, he had a route. You know, with hanging limbs, signs, bridges, all this stuff. You know, anyway, I took that, didn't miss a gear. Nine speed did not miss a gear. Got it back to the yard. He said, now I want, to put, I want you to put this thing right back where you got it from. Then there's about two foot of difference between this trailer and the trailer. Slid that thing in there just like I knew what I was doing. He said, you ready, you ready to go to California? My first trip was Long Beach, California. And, and well, I, I could tell you some stuff about that trip, but... <laughs> Never come close to having a wreck. But I'd, how many has ever drove a semi? How many know you're supposed to downshift before you get to the top of the hill so you won't have to use all your brakes going down the other side? I didn't realize that. <laughs> I smoked them brakes. I cooked. I barbecued brakes for the length of that hill. <laughs> and there's people on the CB. Hey, I smell brakes. I, I don't know who it is. Oh, I mean, I'm pumping them. Thing. And right at the foot of the hill, at the foot of the hill is a way station. I got to stop. I'll pull in there and it looked like somebody back there cooking. Man, that smoke roll. I just, I just drove them on through. Uh, Y'all get a kick out of this. Sometimes I drove, for, I drove for a little over two years all over this nation. And sometimes Trisha would go with me about every three to four months. Trisha would ride with me. So we was going from Fort Worth, we was going from Fort Worth to Miami, Florida. And you remember where we lived out at uh, uh, Lake Country? <laughs> we got in the truck and taken off, you know, get out to the interstate and pull out. And I said, oh, man, can you believe these people? They're pulling, don't they? I'm just going on at these people. She said, Rob, those people can't hear you. I'm talking to the people. I am talking to the people. They don't know what I'm not going on. Those people can't hear you. Before we got to Atlanta, Georgia on I-20, she's talking to the people. Can you believe those people don't know? I was like, you go, girl. <laughs> oh, mercy. God is so good. So good. But one day, while I'm, while I'm reminiscing and talking about how good God is, when I was, when I was uh, in school, 
uh, our folks were so poor we didn't have we didn't we we just we didn't we was poor didn't know it and we I never traveled never did anything but I could look at a map pastor and I could travel I'd go overseas I'd go to different parts of this nation I'd just travel I'd look at that map and travel I'd read about the places I was going to and and this is in in, in elementary and junior high and and how I would travel on a map. Well, I'm going from Fort Worth, Texas, up to Denver, Colorado. We had the two trucks going up to the meeting. And I'm riding along, and I just busted out crying. Wow. Just bust out crying. Yeah. I said, God, you love me so much that you would allow me to travel all over this nation. I drove to many, many, many states in that semi. That you would bless me to do this and pay me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it, man, it touched my heart. It touched my heart. Trisha went with us on a lot of trips, a lot of trips. But God loves you so much that He cares about the little things in your life, the small things, your dreams, your imaginings, good things, good imaginations. And He wants to bless you right where you are. Amen. Well, before I get into this, I want Trisha to come up and greet the people. There's a microphone there. And... Uh, <clears throat> this this woman God put in my life for such a time as this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. And don't preach. <laughs> no, you can't. The woman can preach. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. We just love your pastors. And yes. It's good to be here. Um, I just want, I want to introduce my son and grandsons and and. Uh, I sort of say their wives, one of them's wife, one of them's fiance. They're here with us. Y'all stand. Oh, stand. Just say hi. This is Ronald. This. Uh, my, our youngest son, Ronald. He lives in Marietta. And Blake, his son, and his wife, Ashley, and Derek, and Derek's fiance. Oh, good. Yeah. So we're, we're so excited to have them here. So excited. I believe this is a day, a history making day. Yes. I really do, you know, and I thought about the things that uh, John, Pastor John shared about how he met Rob and um, some things Rob just shared. It's, it's just amazing how God maneuvers your life, isn't yes. it? It's yes. just amazing. You just have no idea. You know, I, I, I say this often. In 1975, June of 1975, someone said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord, or said, would you go to church with me? And I said to that person, I'll go anywhere with you. And that person was Rob Sowell. <laughs> that person was Rob Sowell. And my life was a mess. My son is here to testify to that. Our whole, our life was a mess. But I was crying out for something I knew there had to be a God, and there had to be more to life than that. And this guy that I met at 12 years old came back in my life and said, you want to go to, he'd been praying for me for three months, and I hadn't seen him in 12 years, for three months. So somebody's been praying for yes, you yes. today. If you, or someone's praying for one of your relatives or your children or someone that you love and you care about, God's got somebody praying yes. for God's divine intervention to come into their life. Yes. And so that, that day, I, you know, I thought, I'll go anywhere with you, you know. It wouldn't matter where it was. So I went to church with him, and my life was changed forever that day. Radically, radically saved. Radically saved. Yes. My whole life was changed. So, you know, it's, it's amazing how you, somebody can invite you. Mm -hmm. It may not be in a church setting like this, but somebody can invite you somewhere. Cross your path like, like Pastor John when Rob crossed his path. And you never know, it's a rippling effect yes. of what God's going to do with that divine relationship of somebody that's, that's in your life. That's true. So I believe today that we're here today because there's something God has for you that he's imparted into Rob that he can deliver to you. And I do know this, that one word from God can change yes. your life forever. One word, one phrase, one word, one scripture can change your life forever. So if you open up your heart today, I believe your life can be changed forever. And maybe you're like me. 
and you needed a whole new direction for your life, then God has that. God has that for you today. Amen. We're so, we're, we, just, we just love go, coming into churches and being a blessing. Yes. We pastored 35 years, no longer pastoring, just uh, traveling. We lo- no. <laughs> Be quiet. Love, we loved pastoring church similar to this. Just, they're our family. But now God has us on an assignment to travel all over the world and minister to uh, and strengthen pastors and ministers. You know, how do you know they, they need, maybe these people need a little help here, right here. No, I was teasing. We love them. We love them. We see them every Jan- at least in January at Brother Copeland's Ministers Conference. And we, we liked them as soon as we, we met them. Yes. And I don't know why we haven't come here before. Timing. It's just God's timing, isn't it? Timing. Well, I'm going to give this back to Rob. It's good to be here. I believe something good is about to happen for yes. you today. Yes. We have to believe that, right? Yes. I hope you have your faith out and you have great expectation Amen. that something good is going to happen for you today, that your life will be changed today forever, that you'll leave this place different than the way you came in, Amen. that you'll never be the same as, as when you came in today, that something good will happen for you, that God will touch you everywhere you hurt, and he'll give you words from heaven that will download inside of you, that will change you and put you on course and change your direction, that you'll hear from God today. And that you'll be changed because you were in the house of God today. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. Glory. <clears throat> Told you she could preach. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, real, real quick. My uh, testimony of salvation, when, uh, when I was 17, I was living with my, <clears throat> my sister and brother-in-law, my Father passed away when I was seven, and my mother when I was 16. I didn't realize this was several years ago, and Tricia said, you were an orphan. Didn't realize it. But anyway, anyway, I was living with my sister and brother-in-law, and I'm the youngest of seven children. My older brother uh, was 12 years older than me. He got born again, and I'm sitting at home at, uh, at my brother-in-law and sister's house one evening, 17 years old, March 1962. If somebody's doing math now, I'm going to find out. I'm 59 also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my brother called me and said, Robbie said, uh, would you like to ride over to Plant City, which is about 30 miles from the town I was in in Bartow down in central Florida, and just go to a tent meeting, a camp meeting with me tonight? I said, sure, anything to get out of the house. I just wanted to go. And that 30-mile trip was a long way, two-lane road. So anyway, we got over there, and the tent probably seated 100, 120 people. It wasn't full. And I'm sitting there listening, listening to the evangelist. And he's ministering. He's sharing the Word of God. And when he said, is there anyone here that wants to meet this Jesus I've been talking about? I went up up front. I went up, I went up up front, right in front of him, on my knees, weeping. And at 17, I turned my life over to God. And my brother, my brother was responsible for that. He's since gone to heaven. And f- probably, probably two week and a half after that, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. That was radical. <laughs> and then probably within a month, not at that particular meeting, but at a month or so, I heard the Spirit of God tell me, he said, you will preach my word. Mm-hmm. And I, it was right here, right, right here. I was 17 when I heard that. I didn't answer him. For 17 years, I was 34 years old when I said yes to God. Don't be like I was. If he says for you to do something, Pastor, I look back at 17, I wanted to work with Billy Graham Crusade. I had a heart to work for Billy Graham. Never did pursue it. Loved the man. Never did pursue it. But look at all the years that I could have done stuff. And could have been acted for Jesus, but didn't do it. So if you know you're supposed to do something, do it. Follow through with it. And, and don't look, now, now I look back, thank God I don't have any regrets because God is the forgiver of my past and my present shame. He is my forgiver. But don't, don't let time pass you by 
and you say, I should have done this. No, if he's called you to do something, do it. Wow. Don't let... Don't let money stop you. Oh, I, I can do this because of money. I can do it. No, no, no. There's no safer place to be than in the will of God. That's true. And no more, no more of a prosperous place to be than in the will of God. So just, just do what God says for you to do. Amen? Amen. Well, how many is ready for the word? Yes, I am. Hallelujah. Pastor said, let me ask you this. I'm not a long-winded preacher. I am preach for two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. No. There, this is... This is funny. I, I was reading about D.L. Moody one time, and, and some, he said one evangelist told him, he said, Brother Moody, I can preach for an hour and a half for two hours. He said, are you really that good? <laughs> <laughs> but sir, who will give me just 15 minutes? That's 15, 30, 45, hour, <laughs> hour 15. I, and I went, I won't do that. <laughs> Pastor Charles said, shut up. <laughs> Oh, glory. God is so good. Uh, let's look. I, I want to talk about, I, I want to share, I want to share with you. I'm probably going to share some things you've already heard before. Uh, seriously, because this, this man, this man is a, a, a student of the word, studies the word, preaches the word. And as many times as y'all has heard other preachers plus pastor here, you probably received some of this, but you're going to receive it again. Because faith comes by hearing, not by what you've heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And it says by the gospel that Jesus preached. So hopefully you're going to get something out of this. And I still want to have the, I want to have the attitude Peter had. He said, uh, I, I believe as long as I'm in this body, I'm supposed to stir you up. Yeah. So I'm going to share something with you that's inside of you that's going to stir you up for you to be active on the word that I share with you today. And then you think about what Jesus said in John 6, uh, chapter 6 and verse 63. My, my capsule of this is, he said, what I'm speaking to you today is spirit and life. He said, the word that I'm speaking to you today is spirit and life. Yes. So if you'll receive this and say, God, and, and Trisha in my prayer this morning before we ever left the hotel room was, God, I thank you that people are here with hearing ears and receptive hearts. And you will take out, you will take out of here something, like Trisha said, one word that can change your life forever. Amen. Uh, before I do get into the word, can I share this about a hundred? You believe in a hundredfold return? How many believe in a hundredfold return? I'm going to bless your heart. Bless your wallet. This, it doesn't say, it doesn't say a hundred times in the scripture. It says a hundredfold. It talks about the hundredfold return. It says conventional wisdom. Y'all, you're going to have to, you got to strap your seatbelts on. It says conventional wisdom says that it's physically impossible to fold a piece of paper in half more than seven times. However, according to The Economist magazine, if you were to keep folding it and doubling its thickness, math principles theorize that the concentrated piece of paper would grow to astronomic heights. How many want to know what those heights are? <laughs> Tenfold. Ten. Tenfold. <laughs> Tenfold. How many, you're going to love this. Can I, can I pull a funny? Yes. How many know that I got 11 fingers? How many, how many fingers you see? How many fingers? Including the thumb. Ten. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, and five more is 11. Teach that to your child. <laughs> Blake, did you get that? Blake, <laughs> Blake is our college man. He's a, he's a, he, thank God he went to college and, and did. I'm going to brag on you just a little bit. Can I do that? He, he went to college, attended, attended Spray Bear School there in Atlanta, went to college and set records in football as a linebacker. And those records are going to stand for a long time. <laughs> and then he come out and married a good-looking woman. And both of them are doing great in their, in their career. Both of them are blessed. And they're our grandchildren. And then we got one setting up. He said, now I, I'm going to do it, Derek. <laughs> Derek didn't go to college because he was too smart. <laughs> 
So, hey, I'll tell you what. College is not for everybody. Some people go to college and waste their time and their parents' money. Amen. <laughs> but Derek, Derek, Derek is, is ex, does exceptional in his career. Uh, he's advancing, increasing, and, and moving right along in his career and blessed. And his future wife went to the Kennesaw School that you, who was talking about? That you were talking about? In nursing. So she's, so she's in a nursing program. We're blessed. Yes, and it's so good to have the grandchildren here. So good. Now, how many, how many, and Ron, this guy started it all. He's the, he's the, fa he's the father, he's the father of these two, so he's, he gets credit for that. Now, how many is ready for some numbers? Ten folds, the width of a hand. This is a hundredfold return. Twelve folds, the height of a stool. Fourteen folds, average adult height, which is about my height. <laughs> average. <clears throat> then you have 20 fold that from 14 to 20 20 folds the quarter of the Sears Tower wow. 25 folds the height of the Matterhorn 30 folds outer atmosphere of the earth wow. 50 folds the distance to the sun how many know how far the sun is? 93 million miles. Do you know the sun is up seven minutes before you ever see it? Wow. It's up seven minutes before your eyes ever see it. Seventy folds, 11 light years from the earth. 100 folds. Now this is what impressed me. 100 folds. The radius of the known universe. Wow. Wow. That tells me, Pastor, that, that encapsules the, or the kingdom of Almighty God. That's bigger. Big, God, God's kingdom is bigger than that. Amen. Well, that's just a little bit of mathematics. Math, mathematics. Mathematics. All right, look, look, in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, look in Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> I want to share, with, like I said, I, I believe this is going to, encourage you. I believe you already know this, but how many know that you are the redeemed? Yes. Scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So we ought to continually say, thank you, God, I am redeemed. How many remember the S and H green stamps? Yep. How many remember the gold stamps? Yep. How many remember the postage stamps? Yep. <laughs> there was a guy one time, Pastor, he said, they got a, got a note, said the, the postage stamps are going to go up a nickel. So he went out and bought 300. So, that's terrible. Eh? I remember, I remember the S and H green stamps. S and H green stamps. We I, it got to where we licked so many. I got me a washcloth and started sticking. I, yeah, yeah. But what would you do? You would take those stamps in and you would get them redeemed. Redeem. You went to a redemption store, a green stamp. The word redeem means to rescue. Jesus is our Redeemer. He is the one who rescued us. I was, th I was thinking about this, and I, I, I like animals. I love animals. And I watch Animal Planet. <clears throat> How many watch Animal Planet? I see Animal Planet, see all those puppies and cats and whatever. And have you ever, have you ever, seen, a, have you ever seen a dog sitting in the cage and they just sitting there, you know, just look, they just look so forlorn? And they know, they know that if, if they're not, if they're not in a, a place that's going to keep them, they're going to get euthanized. But they just look so, they just look so forlorn. And then finally somebody comes and rescues them. Yeah. And then they show you the picture. They show you the video of what the dog acts like now since he's been rescued. Yeah. Totally different. <laughs> totally. How many, how many know yeah. what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. Totally different. His eyes are different. His expression. How should we look and act knowing that we have been redeemed from the pits of hell? As Pastor said a while ago, one man's offense, one man's obedience. Thank God for the obedience of the cross. Thank God for the obedience of the Christ. Amen. So we need to have that understanding. I am, I have been, and I am the redeemed. Amen. So that needs to continually, continually be fresh on our mind. I've been born again since 1962. Uh, that makes what? 
55 years? I was born in 65. That's <laughs> 50, 55 years, 57 years, 58. You do I hear 59? No. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, I've been born again since I was 17. I still have those deep emotions of my day of salvation, my moment of salvation. Jesus means so much to me. He means more to me now than he did in 1962. All the things he's brought us through, the family, Ron knows what he's brought us through. Ron knows what he's brought us through. We didn't have to stay there. He brought us through it. He is my redeemer. He is the one who rescued me. And going back to the puppies, whether, whether people realize it or not, in their heart, if they're not born again, they want to be rescued. In, in their heart, in their heart, they want to be rescued. They may not understand all the stuff, but they, they, they have that knowing. There's someone out there, just like Tricia said, there's, there's, life has got to be better. There's got to be a God. But in their heart, they know they want to get rescued. Just like, that, just like the nurse, you know, the, the professor. They had to heard the testimony a while ago. Had to get blind, behind that or into that analytical mind. No, no, no. Into the heart. Yes. It's not a mind thing. It's a heart. It's a heart issue. I remember when I got born again, I was a cusser. I had three brothers older than me. I'm the youngest of four brothers. Four sons. I'm the youngest. And they taught me how to cuss. I had cousins. I called them cuss fuzzins. They were first cousins. I called them cuss fuzzins. They taught me how to cuss. I knew how. Do you ever know how to cuss? I could cuss. I could teach a sailor how to cuss. I cussed so bad at 16 years old, my next oldest brother, he said, Rob, you have got a filthy mouth. I said, really? Look where, I'm, I mean, I, thank God for redemption. The day after I got saved, this is how I know it's a heart issue. The day after I got born again, I was living with my sister and brother-in-law, and I made a mad dash to the bathroom. How many of you, uh, you just, I mean, you got to go, you got to go. And I took off around that corner, and my little toe caught the door facing. I was in a hurry. It peeled that toenail back up. I looked, and it was just wiggling. Hey, there, hey, there. The first thing out of my mouth was, it was either hallelujah or praise God. The day before, it would have been something else. <laughs> and I knew, I knew. I mean, then I knew. I knew, right then I knew my heart had been changed. Cussing was no more part of me. Was no more part of me. It was, it was, it was such no more part of me. When I was 18, I started to work at the uh, phosphate mines in, in Central Florida. And people, people that I worked with found out I was born again. Well, they could be telling a dirty joke. I'd walk up, they'd quit. They'd quit talking. They, would, they wouldn't cuss around me. I didn't say anything. They just quit. It was Christ in me who is a hope of glory. They'd just, they'd just quit cussing because of who was in me. Amen. So if you're born again, you carry within you the very... Oh, get, Pastor, get a hold of this. You carry within you, the scripture says in Romans 8, 11, if you're born again, if you're engrafted into Christ, you have within you the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And then have the attitude of Paul, that I may know him and know him in the power, in the power of him. His resurrection. You have within you the power of the resurrection. Wow. We don't have to do what we used to do. We, we, don't have to do. we don't have to do the habits. We don't have to participate in the habits that we had. Why? Because the real us. The real us. According to, according to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, it says, the real, according to this world, this is my paraphrase, according to this world, you're dead. 
according to the world, you're dead. But the real you, the new you, the real you, the new life in you is hidden with Christ in God. Hallelujah. The real you. So when we, when we get born again, they, oh, and I like this too. 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, uh, he says, those who are engrafted in Jesus Christ is a brand new creation, a brand new creature, never, never before existed. Never before. You're brand new. The old, this is how the Amplified says, the old moral and spiritual conditions have passed away. The fresh and new has come. Amen. Well, if that don't make you want to shout, oh, if that don't light your wood, your wood's wet. Look at how many found Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Let's look in, let's look in verse. I'm going to read several scriptures to you. You can't get too much of the word. And this, this is what the Amplified says. Someone said, you know, someone says, you know why the, the Amplified Bible, you know they call it a woman's Bible? Do Bible? you all know that? You know why? It's so wordy. Isn't that bad? Isn't that bad? <laughs> moving, moving right along. <laughs> oh my, telegraph, telephone, telewoman. <laughs> I, I, I got to live with her, so it'll, that'll catch me this afternoon. So no. <laughs> now let, listen to this. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, he says, for this reason, we also, from the day we heard it, have not ceased to pray and make special requests for you, asking that you may be filled. Now, this is for us. This, we ought to receive this as a prayer for us. That you may be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of His will in all, in all spiritual wisdom, in comprehensive insight, into the ways and purposes of God and in understanding and discernment in spiritual things. That is a powerful statement. And that's how God wants us to live with it, knowing, knowing who He is and having that insight. Then it goes on to say that you may walk. Now hang on to this. He says that you may walk, live, and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. He's not talking to preachers. He's talking to the church. Worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, and desiring to please Him in all things. I, 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 I'll continue with that. I heard a pastor say one time down in, in, in Florida, he said, when he graduated from high school, and this, this registered in me, this was probably two years ago, soon to be two years. His father was a police chief in the, in the city down there in central Florida. And come high school graduation, he, he played on the baseball team. He had a scholarship to Clemson. You know, he was well known in the school and the community. And come time for graduation, he had an opportunity to go with the kids to go to the beach. I mean, how many people know what I'm talking about? They go to the beach and they just swim and play. And play. And play. Right, boys? Is there anything? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, but they, so he said, he said, his dad, he said, he said, you know what's going to happen if you go with them. He was a good kid. He was a good kid. Made good grades in school. Just a good, good family. A good, good family. So he said, uh, he said, you know what's going to happen if you go? You're going to do this, this, and this. And uh, he said, do I have your permission to go? He said, not really, no. But it's up to you. But you don't have my permission. Pastor, that weighed on me. When we do something, we need to ask God, God, do I have your permission? Do I have your permission to say this? Do I have your permission? To We're supposed to conduct ourselves worthy and in a manner worthy of the Lord. Do I have your permission to say this? Do I have your permission to go here? Do I have your permission to put this in my body? Do I have your permission to fellowship with this person? And he'll speak just like that. He'll speak to you. He won't speak to you. He'll speak to your heart. He'll speak to your inner man. God, do I have your permission to do those things? And you can look in the Word and find out if it's contrary to a good life. Amen? We're redeemed from that. 
Then he goes on to say, I hope y'all got that. Then he goes on to say, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing, steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper, and clearer insight, acquaintance, and recognition. We pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power. These are powerful words. Not some power, but all power. According to the might of His glory to exercise. Let me know what exercise does. Exercise, will, it, will, it will help your physical body. Spiritual exercise will help your spirit man and also your soul. We need to have, we need to have the, uh, we need to have the, take, take to heart what uh, John said. He said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Then he goes on to say, uh, that you may be invigorated, strengthened with all power according to the might of His glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience, perseverance and forbearance with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has, who has, that's past tense, who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, that is God's holy people in the light. And I get a hold of this. The Father has delivered and drawn us to Himself. And if we'll, if we'll take aim at this, if we'll set our heart and set our mind on what this Scripture is saying, this will keep us from sin. Going back, going back to what my, my brother, when, when I got born again, he gave me a small New Testament. I mean, a little red, red little testaments. And in that he wrote, he said, Rob, uh, this book, will keep you from sin. And then below it he said, sin will keep you from this book. Closer to the Word, closer to the Father. Closer to the Word, closer to obedience. Further from the Word, further from obedience. Further from the Word, further from the Father. He's not moving away from us. We, we move away from Him. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He'll always be there. But it's up to us to maintain that relationship with godly fellowship. Then he goes on to say, The Father has delivered and drawn us to Himself out of the control, out of the control and the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have our redemption. We are the redeemed. We have our redemption through His blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. Amen? I don't, I don't know a person who is perfect in this world. Your spirit man is perfect. Our spirit man, being born again, our spirit man is perfect. But how many is having to deal with the flesh? We deal with the flesh every day. I deal with Tr Trisha's flesh every day. Every day. No. I will. But we deal, we deal with our flesh every day. But we, don't allow, we, we shouldn't allow our flesh to condemn us. I, I, God told me this one time, Pastor. He said, don't let. Help me, you might have moved this way. He said, don't, don't let your, your, your mind that is not born again condemn your, your forgiven spirit. Don't allow your mind, which is not born again, to condemn your forgiven spirit. So when we take control, God, I, I refuse this. I refuse that. If I do this, God, I repent. If we repent a hundred times a day, Thank God. I, I read a book one time, a, a life of repentance is a joy-filled life. If you go days without repentance, condemnation sets in. Amen. But thank God He has qualified. He has transferred us from the dominion of darkness. Thank God the, darkness no longer has dominion over us. Now get a hold of this. I'm, 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 I'm going to do this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And let's listen to this. Chapter 1, verse 7. In Him, in Him, chapter 1, verse 7, the book of Ephesians, the Amplified Bible says, In Him we have redemption 
deliverance and salvation through His blood. Thank God for the blood. Through His blood, the remission, forgiveness of the, listen to this, forgiveness of our offenses, forgiveness of our shortcomings, forgiveness of our trespasses in accordance with the riches and generosity of His gracious favor. The King James says, because of His grace. Thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. Amen. Sometimes we just need to look in the mirror and say, thank God I'm redeemed. I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what's going on around me. Thank God I am the redeemed. I have been rescued. I have been brought from darkness into light. Sin has no dominion over me. How many know there's sin runs rampant in the world? We don't have, we don't have to participate in it. In today's society, in today's society, if you stand up for what the scripture says about what people say, about what the government says about lifestyle, you'll be condemned. The government's not going to get you to heaven. It's just not going to happen. Uh, uh, correct speech. Well, what is it? Uh, uh, what do they call it? Political, political correctness is not going to get you to heaven. Sin is sin. I said sin is sin. Amen. Sin is sin. People say, oh, you just made a mistake. No, jerk, you sinned. You committed a sin. God forgives sin. Amen. Thank you, Father. But we have been redeemed through His blood. Praise God. Now let's go, let's go over to uh, uh, verse 17. And this is what Paul told the church in, in Ephesus. He said, For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that He may grant you, take this personal church, that He may grant me a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mystery. If we can get a hold of this, we can find out the mysteries of God. That He may grant you a spirit of wisdom, revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of Him. How do you get to know someone? My, th these boys can call me anytime. They say, hey, I, I know who it is. They don't say, hey, Granddad, this is Blake. No, no, no. I know who it is. Ron, I know who it is. I got called a lot of D. That's how I know who it is. I recognize that name. Hey, Blake. <laughs> But before, before caller ID, how many remember the party lines? How many remember the telegraph? How many remember Pony Express? No. <laughs> the guy right behind you knows Pony Express. <laughs> we used to, we, we didn't have a phone in our house. We didn't have a phone in our house until I was 11 years old. 11 years old. I, we didn't have a TV until I was 11 years old. My father died, like I said, when I was seven years old. That was 1952. And my mother remarried in 1956. And the man she married had a TV, black and white TV. <laughs> black and white, black, black and white. Y'all don't know what that is, do you? Do y'all know what, y'all know, you know how to change channel? You know, how, many remember, how many remember the antenna outside the house? We were, you got, yeah, yeah, Ron's got one now. He's, 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 he wants to get beyond that cable deal, so he stuck him a, that's a real nice antenna, isn't it? You know what I'm <laughs> but we were, money. yes, save money. We were, we had, we had the, we had the, we had the TV right beside the chimney. It was hooked up to the chimney up above the house in, in uh, central Florida. And the TV was sitting there, so we'd, we'd reach out the window or go outside and turn the antenna. And, and watch that fuzzy thing. Hold, hold it, hold it, right, hold it right there. It's clear now, hold it. Oh man, you turned it too far. Turn it back. You remember that? Yes. Yeah? And how many remember you had to get up off the couch or chair and go change the channel? Yes. How many remember the brightness and the contrast and the fine tuning and all this kind of stuff, the horizontal and the, you know, y'all don't, they're saying, huh? <laughs> how many remember, how many remember three channels? 
8, 9, and 13. Yep. Two five. <laughs> but that, how did I get off on that? Yeah, how would you know someone? <laughs> that's a good one. Thank you. you get, that's right. That's right. He knows. By talking to him. And that, I don't know how I got off on the TV, but thank you for bringing me back on the line. See what a son is good for. He, to, he told me one time, he said, Dad, he said, he said Tim, Tim's good for $10 an hour. James is good for 12 He said, I won't charge you nothing. I said, does that mean you're good for nothing? No, I didn't say no. <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, he's, he has a special place in my, in my heart. But anyway, anyway, how do you get to know someone? And going back to the party line, I picked up that phone, and you, you could listen to people's conversation, and after a while you recognize their voices. And you hold the receiver and just listen. They're supposed to have a time limit. They didn't know what time it was. But now, now, now someone can call and you know who's speaking to you simply because you spoke to them long enough, had many conversations, and you recognize their voice. God is speaking to you every day. If you look in Colossians chapter, we're not going to go there, but look in Colossians chapter 5 and how many know where the fruit of the Spirit is? Verse 20, 22. Above that, it says your spirit man and your flesh are in constant battle with one another. Constant, constant battle with one another. So God is always speaking to our spirit, but it's up to us to have our ears open to hear what he's saying to us. He will lead you and guide you in the direction that your life needs to go. Amen? So we really, really need to listen to him. And I'll let Lana go on him. Having eyes, listen to verse, verse 18. Having, having, eyes of, having the eyes of your heart flooded with light, so that you can know and understand the hope to which He has called you and how rich is His glorious inheritance in the saints, His set-apart ones. And so that you, take this very personal church, and so that you may know and understand what is the immeasurable, what is the immeasurable, we're going back to the hundredfold return, what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of His power in, in, and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of His mighty strength. Did y'all get that? The power of Almighty God working inside of us. The power of the resurrection working inside of us. Active inside of us. I wish I, I seriously wish I had two or three hours. Not in not in one setting on this, but there there, there needs to be some there. Go get do do some homework. Do some spiritual homework and read this. Get in there and read it and and, and take it for yourself. In verse twenty it says, which he exerted in Christ. Now get a hold of this, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and in this world, but also in the age and the world which are to come. And he has put all, thing, all things under his feet. Who are we? We're the body of the Christ under His feet, and has appointed Him, Jesus, the universal and supreme head of the church, us, a headship exercised throughout the church, which is His body. The fullness of Him, which is His body. The fullness of Him, which is His body. The fullness of Him who fills all in all, for in that body lives the full measure of Him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with Himself. Church, we are the body of the Christ. We have the very same power that Jesus had when He walked the earth, the very same power that He had when He was resurrected because that very same power lives in us. Yes, amen. And, it's to, and it's to be exercised through us. I got one finger at you and three back at me. So we need to pay attention to what we do in public places. 
I, I, we, we, we're being visualized by the world. True. Whether you realize it or not, you're, you're in the eyes of the world. And if you're born again, especially, you are in the eyes of the world. They know who you are. I'm going to share this quick testimony. I'll begin to, begin to close. I won't honor time. When I told you I got born again at 17, I backslid when I was 22 years old. It's totally backslid. For five years, I was away from God, from 22 to 27. It cost me dearly. It cost me. The worst thing I did, the worst thing I did before I got born again, I smoked. Back then, you know, I was five, six years old. My uncles would come in the house and they'd hand me a little cigarette and I'd walk behind the door. People in there smoking. You can tell the kid behind the door smoking. I'm sitting back there smoking. Five, six years old. I'm a big boy. I, 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 I was so tall I could have bit him on the kneecap. <clears throat> and sat back there sucking on that cigarette, puffing on the cigarette. Well, I started buying my cigarettes when I was 10 years old, 25 cents a pack. The most I, listen to this, whoever smokes, the most I ever paid for a pack of cigarettes was 35 cents, and I thought that was highway robbery. <laughs> we were in a store the other day, and Tricia said, would you mind if I ask you how much that girl j just went up, paid for that carton of cigarettes? She said, $52. I used to pay $3.50 for a carton. $3.50 for a carton. Hallelujah. Now, why did I get off on that? I have no idea. <coughs> moving right, moving right along. Yeah, thank you. Thank. See, this is what this is what this person in the second row is good for. Worst thing I ever did was smoke. Worst thing I ever did was drink this much alcohol. Never got drunk. Didn't get drunk until I was 22 years old. Was that stupid? Was that stupid? <laughs> Absolutely stupid. Well, I and, I, and I started drinking. It cost me and what have you. Well, I worked at the phosphate mines, and they knew that I was born again. Worked there till probably, I hired in at 60, 1963 and worked till 1969 or 70. And I had a blue pickup, blue Chevrolet pickup. And I was driving home from work one day. Well, I stopped at this little, little beer joint. I mean, know what a beer joint is. I mean, know what a juke joint is. A juke joint. I pulled in this little TikTok, TikTok, TikTok beer joint. Well, I parked my truck there, walked inside, and I was having a beer. And uh, the next day at work, a friend of mine who knew, uh, he, was, uh, he was a year ahead of me in high school. Well, he knew I was born again. He knew I was saved and what have you. He said, Rob, said, did you have truck trouble yesterday? I said, no, why? He said, well, I saw your truck there at the TikTok. And he said, I thought you might have had to. He said, uh, what happened? I said, well, I was, in, I was inside. Really? What was you doing inside? I said, I was sitting there having a drink. He said, really? I said, yeah, I was, I was, had, I was having a beer with old Moose. Moose was a guy that worked. I mean, they want a Moose is. He was a big old boy. So I said, no, I was sitting there having a, having a beer with Moose. People, the look on his face. I'm thinking about it almost week. He said, not you, Rob. Not you. You didn't do that. I had to turn around and walk off. He was watching my life. He was watching me. It cost me people. It cost me acquaintances. But I look back and say, thank you, Father. You are my Redeemer. You have redeemed me. You have redeemed me. I heard a pastor say, that. I'll, I'll close with this. So much more, so much more. I heard a pastor say this one time. Listen carefully to this. I was part of the ministerial association meeting there in Christiansburg, Virginia. And we'd meet once a, once a month on Thursdays. And a, a pastor or a minister would have a small devotion, five or ten minutes devotion, and then we'd do the pastoral meeting stuff. Well, this, this uh, Baptist pastor who come from a Pentecostal, you remember, you remember the name, uh, uh, he used to call him Brother Pentecost, Duplessy? His son was a pastor of a Baptist church, and they called him Brother Pentecost. I asked him one day, I said, Brother, how did you wind up a pastor in a Baptist church? He said, well, when he met his, he said, when I met my wife, it was easier for me to adapt to being a pastor than her to adapt to being a Pentecostal. Is that a trade-off? So anyway, 
So, but he told me, listen carefully to this. Listen very, very, very carefully to this. He said he told his congregation one day, not this, this was Thursday. He said, I told my congregation this past Sunday. He said, how sad it will be that many of y'all will go to heaven, but you'll send a lot of people to hell by your lifestyle, by what they see, by what they're paying attention to. How sad it will be. People are watching us. People are paying attention to us. People know what we're doing. People hear what we're saying. We were, we were sitting in this restaurant last night. And I, you didn't notice it, but the people sitting behind you, Trisha and I say, that guy turned around. He's turned around and he's listening to us. Yeah. We're talking about God. We're talking about spiritual things. And he's tuned in to us. He's tuned in. I don't know if he was agreeing with us, but he was paying attention to what we were saying. People hear what you're saying. They see what you're doing. You think you're hiding? You're not hiding. You're alive. You're, you, the scripture says you stand naked before God. I don't like to stand naked before nobody. <laughs> I tell people. I tell people when I was when I was Blake and and, uh, and Derek's age, I was like twisted steel. But now I'm like Reynolds wrap. <laughs> I look in the mirror and say, who is that guy? That's, well, I'm moving right along. <laughs> I, tell people, I tell people, years. I, I used to have a stomach. Thank God my stomach is decreasing. I said, years ago, I used to have more of this and less of this. Now I got more of this and less of this. But, <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> like that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory. But recognize, recognize Jesus as your Redeemer. Get, it, get into Scripture. Get into Scripture and find out about redemption. You have been, you have, Trisha and I were riding down the road. This has been a long time ago, several years ago. And she was reading out of Deuteronomy 28, the blessings of God. And then she got over in the curses. And she said, whoa, 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 wait, wait. She says, we've been redeemed. She'd read it. She said, we've been redeemed from that. Read it. We've been redeemed from that. Read it. We've been redeemed from that. Read it. We've been rede we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from sickness, sin, disease, poverty, lack. We have been redeemed from it. And we need to live like we're redeemed from it. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to ask you a question. A very, very serious question. There's two There's two. There's two times in life that you ask a question. Then there's no, no other question, in my opinion, that can be more important than these. The first question is, is Jesus your Savior? The second question is, have you married the right person? Very, very important. I married the right person. This woman came into my life and got me on track. And look what he brought me. Look what <laughs> So I ask you today, I ask you a very, very serious question today. If you know without a doubt, there's zero doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that Jesus is your Savior and you're allowing Him. This is your choice. You're allowing Him to be the Lord of your life. He can be your Savior without being your Lord. He can be your Savior and you go to heaven. But when you allow Him to be your Lord, that's when you live successful on the earth. When you, when you allow him to be the owner and the ruler of your life, when you say, God, do I have your permission to do this? So I ask you that question. Is Jesus the Savior of your life? You know, without a doubt, heaven is your home. Let me see your hand. No doubt whatsoever. Heaven is your home. Praise God. Well, this boat's loaded. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. He could take us all up right now. Yeah. Not right now, not right now. Thank you, Father. As you hearken and heed the voice of the Lord your God, may the blessings of the covenant come upon you. May the blessings of the covenant become more than printed words on a page. May they become real in your heart. May you be blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the field, blessed in the city. 
May you be the head and not the tail. May you be above only and not beneath. May everything that your hand touches according to the will of God be blessed in Jesus' name. May God command His blessings upon your storehouses, upon your jobs. May He command His blessings on your businesses. May the children of the kingdom, let me say this, may He bless the children, your children and your children's children and your extended families. And may the children of the kingdom of God be ten times wiser than the yes. children of the church, yes. of, the, of the world, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor, thank you for allowing us. I mean that. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Pastor Janie, thank you. Thank you for being you. Amen. God bless you. Pastor. What did he come to tell us? We were redeemed. Isn't that somehow the Lord has sent a man all the way from Virginia just to tell you you're redeemed? How, how valuable is that? Pastor, I, I have to comment as we're getting ready to leave. It's noon. We'll, we'll get you out of here here in just a minute. Um, Jane and I have set aside an honoraria for them, and if you'd like to add to that, you're quite welcome. If you uh, Cash envelopes are available. If you have a, my ushers bring those up. Um, come on up. While you're uh, preparing anything that you would like to give to them, believe me, it'd be they, they, they're living by faith. They don't have a, a, a salary, and as of yesterday, they don't have any, any, uh, uh, any known dwelling place. They've just sold their home and ready to move. How, how would you, you know, I, she and I were talking yesterday how that we lived in the same house for 15 years. Previous to that, we lived in a house for 15 years. We're very anchored people. We don't move much. We don't like to move much, do much of going. I don't even travel out of town much. I like to be here with you. And here they are in their retirement years, pulling up stakes and headed, to, headed south, ready to do another assignment. That's remarkable to me. I couldn't help but think of, in the spirit of the knowledge of redemption, while Pastor Rob was talking, I remembered something that Bill Clinton said. Who in here does not like, no, don't raise your hand, <laughs> Bill Clinton. I didn't particularly like much of anything that the Democratic Party had ever stood for, from abortion to um, everything they stand for, seems like, and about three-fourths of the Republican Party, but reg regardless. <laughs> Bill Clinton said something one day that changed my mindset about him and the Bible and the way God sees men. After all of the scandals and all of the junk, and, all, and you make your checks payable to Church on the Word, not, not after all the scandals, you can make your checks payable <laughs> to Church on the Word and we will see to it that they get every dime that you write. <laughs> After all the scandals, after all, of, after the blue dress, after all, after the Kenneth Star, after all of that, Clinton, one of the last things he did was he flew to um, Atlanta here and spoke at the famed Ebenezer Baptist Church where Martin Luther King was, was raised up and had pastored and his dad had pastored. And he took the pulpit and he said that, it, he said, it, you know, it's, it's a known fact all that I've been through as a president. And, uh, he said, no, I, I swore I would never resign regardless. And he said, but I didn't know whether or not I'd be impeached. He said, and I went in the office one day and sat down, and in and, and Clinton's words, Clinton now, Clinton, said, I prayed. I prayed. He said, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. And he showed me Isaiah 43, verse 1. Do you believe God Almighty would see past all of the flesh and see the heart of a man? He said, the same voice that spoke to me told me to run for president. He said, I have redeemed thee. I looked at that man and I thought, God, forgive me for passing judgment. Who am I of all people 
to judge. He's been my president. I've prayed for him, God. I'm praying for the man now for the last year that he's in office. Give him wisdom. Give him understanding. Direct him. It's well, our lives need it. My kids need my president to do well. Forgive me for being the judge. You are the redeemer of men. You are the Bible says he is the lover of men's souls. The scripture says he is the father of spirits. Changed my mindset. It helped me to prepare to pray for Obama for eight years. Man, I tell you, I laid on my face for three days and groaned and moaned and groaned right after he was elected. I moaned and groaned and groaned and moaned. I did. I was no good to be around for about three days. But I kept remembering what President Reagan said in his final words to us in his final letter to the people when he found out he would have Alzheimer's. He said, I just wish there was some way I could uh, keep Nancy from having to go through what she has to look forward to dealing with someone with this disease. He said, but I know that with your help that she'll be all right. He said, um, and then his final statement, he said, I now begin this, the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. He said, I, but I know, that, oh, I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. That was the last thing he said. I struggled with that last line. That encouraged me right then. But then when we go through stuff with our nation, because as it goes with the pulpit of the Oval Office, so it goes with the nation. As it goes with the pulpit of the Supreme Court, so it goes with our nation where five men can vote something that 300 million people have to uh, adhere to. That is an overreach of power. And so when we'd have those votes that would cause all of us to come under things, I'd say, God, where is our redemption? So you, you'd help me to hear you preach this today. He is still our redeemer, and Trump is not the last Trump of the Bible, but he's one of them on the way to the last Trump in the Bible. And when the election of Donald Trump, I believe, spoke to us that America had been given a stay of execution and uh, the Christians can rise up again. And one of the first things that he did was end the Johnson Amendment that stopped men from being able to say anything they want to in their pulpits. It, it just it gave us it, it put a light again once again on the fact that no matter what, this is not a First Amendment right free speech, no free speech zone. You don't lose your constitutional rights of free speech just because you came into church, whether you're behind the pulpit or, or, or in front of it. But it's all about redemption. Say it, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Filled with the Holy Ghost, I am. And all my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. We used to sing that, didn't we? It's good to have all you folks. All y'all, thank y'all for coming up all the way from Marietta. We appreciate that. Thank you for joining us today for the Word Wise Christian Broadcast here at Church on the Word. Remember, God gave us his written word to get our thinking straightened out. When his mindset becomes our own, peace is always the result. Our believing, our confession gets straightened out. That's when our life gets straightened out because we have just become Word-wise, God bless you. See you next week.